And so the brand identity of Studs is really the studios themselves. And so we spent a tremendous amount of time on the studio design and look and feel and have iterated on that through time, right? And that I think is very different from a branding perspective than, for example, creating a CPG product or creating an apparel product, right? Like for us, brand equals physical environment. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. I am so excited to share today's episode with you, mainly because I recently had a firsthand experience with the brand that's in the spotlight today, Studs. And they are attempting to reimagine the piercing experience, mainly because one of the company's co-founders, Anna Harmon, who's my guest today, had a firsthand experience of what was really missing in the market. So for today's conversation, we dig into that story, not just how she ended up in retail, which is quite the story, by the way, but also how she took her firsthand experience and turned it into a scalable model for retail growth. I loved getting her firsthand insights, not just about the business itself, how it operates, what they've learned about customers, how they go about mapping their customer experiences, but also just her hot takes on what it takes to build a retail brand today. She has truly experienced so much building the business with her co-founder, Lisa. And I think even if building a business is not at your to on your to-do list, you will get some inspiration from her. I really enjoy chatting with her and of course, sharing my experience with the Studs brand. Anna, thanks so much for being on the show. I'm so excited to have you on today. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start a little bit with your background because Honestly, I loved learning about your history in retail. You started your professional career actually as an attorney, but then when you got into retail, you worked with store number eight, served as the interim chief customer officer of Jet Black. I just really loved learning about your entry into retail and your journey in retail. I guess the big question is, what led to this pivot? So while I went to law school and practiced as an attorney for about two years after graduating, I really always knew I wanted to start a company and I probably was always a retailer at heart since I was little. You know, one story I tell to folks on my team frequently is that when I was very little, probably, you know, four or five, I actually set up a store in my room and I would sell my parents back all of my toys that they had obviously (laughs) bought me. And so I think I was both always a little entrepreneur and a little retailer. And so while I was a lawyer and worked in finance and did all of these other things, I think my destiny was sort of always where I've now ended up. That's so fun. I I always loved playing store and, and largely grocery. I never worked for a grocery retailer, but it's just interesting to see and hear how people ended up in this industry, right? Because we all experience commerce. But of course. you ultimately started Studs with your co-founder, Lisa, after noticing a gap in the ear piercing market. How did you uncover this gap? And was it through firsthand experience? Because I feel like a lot of us, if not all of us, have probably had not so great great piercing <laughs> experiences in our past. Of course. And so I actually did experience it firsthand where about five years ago now, I went to go get another piercing and I went to a very premium place in downtown Manhattan and they didn't take appointments. So I just walked in. And they told me I would have to wait about two hours and the place was so premium that I would have spent probably $500 or $750 on just one piercing. And I said to myself, I'm not waiting two hours and this is too expensive. So I ended up going to a tattoo parlor. And while the piercing experience was great, it was done healthily and safely with a needle and I really liked my piercer. I felt very personally out of place in the tattoo parlor and also really didn't like the jewelry and it was also expensive. And so I said to myself, well, what happens if you are my age and you want to go get another piercing? Where do you typically go? And the answer for most customers is the tattoo parlor. And I really thought there 
should be an alternative or a different kind of option. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess the follow up there is knowing that you have these firsthand experiences and that the ideal kind of falls almost between those two experiences, right? Like it's the safety, it's the quality of the end product, in this case, the piercing, but it's also a nice environment. I guess, how did you go about connecting those dots, right? So you knew there was an opportunity. How did you turn that into a differentiated idea? Like how did that lend itself to messaging and positioning and and all of that great stuff that's required to drive and nurture a brand? So for my co-founder, Lisa and I, you know, we really focus on this framework that was developed by Clay Christensen, who was a Harvard professor that's called Jobs to be Done. And we think a lot about the customer jobs to be done. And the whole framework is about how customers hire products to do jobs for them. And so in Studs' case, the jobs that we thought the customer wanted to be done was, I want to go get an ear piercing. I want it to be done healthily and safely with a needle. I want to be in a cute and fun environment because obviously getting piercing should be fun. It's celebratory. People do it to mark occasions, right? And then I want to buy earrings for the holes that I've made in my ears, right? Nobody's getting an ear piercing to have a hole in their ear. They're getting ear piercings to buy earrings. And so for us, we really oriented the whole studs experience positioning wise, design wise, brand wise to address those jobs to be done. I love that. I'm a big nerd when it comes to models. So I've never heard of jobs to be done before. And I'm going to look further into it because I think that's a really effective way to distill, especially for retailers, right? What is really required of a brand or a business. But it leads to, I guess, a follow up question there around how would you define the studs customer, right? Because I feel like piercing, it's kind of a universal thing. It can span genders, it can span age, demographics. So is there a certain person or persona you have in mind or had in mind rather when you were forming the studs business? Yes, definitely. So we were really focused on an 18 to 35 year old. Our median customer age today is 27. Okay. And that customer is typically a second piercing and beyond customer, right? It's not to say people aren't getting their first piercings at studs. Some are, right? But we only pierce 13 and up. And so we were really talking to a customer and positioning the brand for a customer who was a Gen Z or millennial person and was interested in going from having their lobes pierced to having something like seven to nine piercings. That is the studs target market. Excellent. So with that in mind, then, what were the next steps for developing the brand identity? So you mentioned you wanted a cute and fun space and knowing that the median age is 27. Obviously, that opens it up to a lot of fun, creative opportunities. Were there any like core goals or things that you came to the table with saying, yes, when we build this brand, I want it to have X, Y, and Z, or I want it to be X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So I really attribute all of the brand's look, feel, identity to Lisa, my co-founder. You know, we often joke that she's the reason Studs is cool and I'm the reason Studs is functional. (laughs) So I'm speaking mostly- Room for both, right? (laughs) Yeah. And I think, you know, what she was thinking about at the time was one- First and foremost, we really didn't want it to look like every other D to C or millennial brand or as, you know, people sort of derogatorily term them blands. We wanted studs to look different from that. Then I think the interesting thing about studs is obviously while studs has a large digital presence, both via our website and via our social channels, at the end of the day, the majority of customers experience studs in the studios. And so the brand identity of studs is really the studios themselves. And so we spent a tremendous amount of time on the studio design and look and feel and have iterated on that through time, right? And that I think is very different from a branding perspective than, for example, creating a CPG product or creating an apparel product, right? Like for us, brand equals physical environment. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I personally have gotten pierced at studs and I love loved the environment. It was, I think it's the the one at Hudson Yards in the city. And, you know, it it was a smaller space, but it still really felt like it was true to the brand, very dynamic, colorful. So how do you think about translating the brand 
identity to these physical spaces, to a physical point of view, especially because you guys are growing, right? And, you know, there are different space parameters and, you know, different locales, areas that you're growing into. So like, how do you go about balancing all of that? And I apologize, we're getting too deep into store design stuff and we can't get super deep. No, no, no. You know, I think the first thing is, first of all, thank you for coming to Hudson Yards, that we are actually expanding that studio. So it's going to be big and fresh and hopefully open before the end of the year, which is really exciting for us. I think in terms of translating brand to physical environment, the first thing is brand has two components, I would say, in physical environment. One is hospitality, right? Like the brand is not just the way the studio looks and feels to the customer, it's the experience that they have in the studio. And so we're really focused on How do we create an environment where our retail teams can thrive so that they can give customers great experiences? So a lot of how we think about what brand is in the studio is about customers' experiences of the studio when they're in it. Then I think separately, Studs has always been the mix between chic, sort of medispa type environment and a place where you can take friends and take a lot of content and pictures of yourself to post on social, et cetera. And we really had to marry that effectively. And I think we've done that. And so when you go into a studs, you both are in a really fun, colorful, to your point, environment, but you're also in a place that you feel sort of is appropriate to have a hole put through your ear. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say the folks in your store were incredible. The person who did my piercing, the person at the front checked everyone in and like they knew not just the product but the process too i actually got two piercings at once which was kind of bold of me if i look back Ooh. but i know <laughs> i was feeling it that day but they all made me feel so at ease and i felt really welcome and to your point earlier you know when you go into those scenarios you know it's important to feel that right because you may be a little nervous you may not know what to expect so knowing that you have empowered teams in like this clean modern chic environment it just it's kind of the whole package right yeah and we thought about all of the details that relate to that, right? You should have fun candy. You should have stress balls, that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And what are your aspirations, if I may ask, like from a brick and mortar standpoint? Because like I mentioned, you guys are growing and it's so exciting to see. What have you learned thus far in your expansion and how are you kind of applying that moving forward? And this could be in terms of territory and to experience itself. Any key headlines there? Well, we're opening a store this week, funnily enough, in New York. Uh, Another store in Meatpacking will obviously be open by the time this airs. So that'll be our seventh store here. And that'll take us to 24 studios in the U.S. We will end the year with over 30. And I think, you know, we just want to continue to bring studs to more customers and more places. We're obviously expanding rapidly and we want to continue to be able to do that. Yeah, that's great. I do want to make sure we hit on marketing a little bit because like you mentioned, you know, even though the heart of the experience is very much physical, it kind of needs to be, right? You guys do a great job with digital. And what I appreciate is your team, whether it be through the site or through social, there's a really nice balance between the very brand oriented stuff, like the inspiration and like the fun content and the great design and also just the core education, the safety aspects, and basically everything someone would need to understand, you know, oh, like I do want another piercing, like where should I go? Like I learned so much about the different parts of my ear, like I had no idea (laughs) it existed. So I guess I'm curious how your marketing team and your content team kind of strike that balance and ensure consistency along the way, right? Because it's not just what's happening on the website, it's what's happening on social, then, you know, to your point in store. I mean, again, I just commend your team for that balance and that consistency. You know, it's interesting. I will say part of that mix is coming from what the customers are actually looking for. And I think we really benefit from the fact that customers want that education. One of our best performing social assets, as an example, is an ear diagram that, to your point, 
describes the anatomy of your ear. And so I think for some brands, they struggle because they want to provide education, but the customer doesn't really care about education. In our case, the customer actually really cares about education, which helps us because they're responsive to the content we create that is educational. Yeah, I love that you're a diagram, by the way. <laughs> yes, yeah, see, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I shared it with everyone. I was like, which one should I get? Exactly, right? And it's funny because it makes it easy to make educational content because the customer actually wants it and is excited about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and as, since you do very much lean into the operational side and the business side, I do want to make sure we hit on some of that, of course. And as I was prepping for this conversation, I came across an interview you did with Entrepreneur. And there was one quote in particular that really stood out to me because we cover so much about what's happening in retail, emerging brands, obviously, you know, what happens and is happening with the D2C market, especially those that do you look for outside funding from VCs. And you said now investors want conviction, real conviction in the product market fit, a sound revenue and profit generating business model, and your leadership and operating capabilities proven out before they invest. Which like, wow, if you were to distill the entire situation, I think based <laughs> on our coverage, that's really it, right? So what does your product and service strategy look like and your operational strategy? And how does Studs collectively think about, you know, the long-term vision for the business, especially in context of your relationship with customers, right? Because I could imagine in some cases, you know, it's like for some customers, it's like a one and done thing. They just want to get one piercing and that's kind of it. Whereas others, like you said, it's, you know, five, six, seven, even more piercings over time. So I'm curious, like what that big picture kind of looks like for you. So it's interesting. Ironically, I would say we very much have built the thing we intended to build and we're lucky customers like it. Right. But we set out to build a great retail business. Like if you looked at our original pitch decks and our original model, ironically, and where we are today, we have really made the thing that we intended to make. And that thing was an excellent retail business with excellent retail economics that customers also loved. And so for us, everything about the future of studs is about how do you continue to execute at that level in a way that proves to future investors that you have a scalable concept that will have product market fit through time with amazing economics. And in the context of amazing economics for retail, that means we are profitable from the first month of opening our studios. We pay them back really quickly. They have incredible sales per square foot. So all of those things that we set out to do, we've now done. And I think that helps us from a future investability perspective. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. And then I do want to ask, because I feel like starting a business and then building a brand and making sure it's set up for that long-term success, I mean, that's a journey, right? So are there any insights you can share around, you know, know, your personal growth and evolution as a co-founder, as an entrepreneur, especially as you think about like where you want the business to go long term. Like you mentioned, you, you built the business you intended to build. But as you think about your past and the future, I mean, any key reflections or insights you would share there? Because, you know, we do have a lot of folks that are either at the sea level or have co-founded a business, founded a business, want to found a business. So would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, I think the main takeaway that I've experienced in terms of what it's like to actually start a business like this is the first hurdle that you go through is do people actually like the thing you made, right? Because we forget that so many startups fail because they never find product market fit and they had an idea that the customer, be it B2B or B2C, didn't actually want. And so I think step one is you have to make a thing that people want. Step two that not many people talk about is once you've made a thing that people want, it is a marathon and it is not a sprint, right? And so for me, I think one, for studs, we need to continue to make, like I said before, more of studs, bring it to more customers, continue to execute at a high level. And then for me personally, I think the learning has been there's not really quick wins in consumer so once you've made the thing that people are excited about, you just have to keep going and making it more, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that process is long. Like if you think of the best, most influential consumer brands in the world, you know, the Nikes or what have you, those brands are built over 50 plus years. And that 
kind of commitment is what's necessary to start a really enduring consumer brand. And that's the aspiration that we have for studs. And, you know, along those years or over the course of those years, the goal is to continually learn and collect data and insight about the customer who is constantly changing, which you mentioned your customers indicated what they're looking for and what they need from a content perspective. You know, not to put you on the spot, is there anything else that like, you've heard or learned about your customer throughout this journey that, you know, you're kind of setting your sights on or thinking about as you chart your path for the future of studs? I think the thing we've really also learned about the customer is despite the brand being positioned and targeted, as I said, before for an 18 to 35 year old, the customer is really broad. We have 13 year olds in the store, we have 90 year olds in the store, and we need to be able to service them equally. And so I think for us, it's really thinking about how do you do that? How do you create consistency between studios so people will have the same experience from studs no matter where they go and no matter who they are? The brand can't be so targeted at an 18 to 35 year old that it alienates the 13 year old or the 90 year old. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, and it has been so fun getting to learn a little bit more about the studs business from someone who helped build it from the ground up. Are there any other closing tips, lessons, takeaways that you think are important to share with our listeners today? I think the most important thing is I would encourage, you know, customers to really keep shopping, keep exploring. There are always new brands and new experiences that you haven't tried. And I really feel like, you know, some people are worried about the state of retail or its future. And I feel like retail is really thriving. Yeah, I agree. And honestly, my favorite thing is to try new brands. I claim that it's research. So (laughs) I'm going to stick with that. And I think it is. (laughs) Well, Anna, I appreciate you taking the time out. It has been a real pleasure chatting with you and not just learning about the business, but learning about your firsthand experiences too. I think it really just adds a whole other layer and dimension to these incredible stories about incredible brands like studs. Thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. And to all of you listening, hope you got some great insights, nuggets of wisdom from Anna today. We would love to hear your thoughts on the show, on the episode. Leave us some feedback on socials. We are on LinkedIn largely at Retail Touchpoints or on X at Our Touchpoints. And of course, uh, leave us a rating or review on your preferred podcast player. That way we can elevate the show and get these great conversations front and center with other listeners. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, frankly, anywhere else. We're probably there too. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to the show. We have new episodes coming to you weekly featuring folks like Anna who are basically shaping the future of retail. So if you do, you will get the latest and greatest episodes delivered right to your devices. But for now, that's it from us, everyone. Thank you again so much for joining us. We will see you next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up.